utilization of mental health resources within Houston, primary, primarily in the Latinx and African American communities. Just importantly, we also want to thank you, the Greater Houston, for joining us this evening for this event, the second of our dialogues focusing on mental health. We want to give a special thanks to the NAMI family, NAMI Greater Houston, Neil Sarahan, Angelina Hudson, Jessica McDaniels, Asta Sharma, and Aditi Chokti. About our speakers and present presenters tonight, let me give you a little bit of bio about them and then we'll get right into the questions and conversation. Thank you again for joining us. Dr. Rita Walker is a licensed psychologist and professor of psychology at the University of Houston. She has published more than 60 scientific papers on psychological risk and resilience in the African American, American mental health community. Her recent release book is the Un Unapologetic Guide to Black Mental Health. I'm posting the book, I'm holding up here. I'll show a picture of it on the cover. Uh, it's a great book and you can pick it up on Amazon. Dr. Luis Medina, is a bilingual and bicultural licensed clinical psychologist and cultural neuropsychologist. He received his BA in psychology from Yale University and, and his MS and PhD in clinical psychology and neuropsychology from San Diego State University, University of California, San Diego, joint doctoral program of clinical psychology. Dr. Uh, Medina has completed his clinical post-predoctoral internship at the West Los Angeles Veteran Affairs Medical Center. We, join, we thank you, both of you, for joining us tonight. Can you tell me a little bit about how and why you approached the field of psychology uh, Dr. Walker, if you go first, and then Dr. Medina follows, and what you found so fascinating about the uh, discipline of psychology today. Absolutely, and if I could first, uh, just thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so glad to be here on behalf of NAMI Houston and speaking to the NAMI Houston family and, and all who are, are curious about psychology, because that's where it actually started for me. Just the idea that how we think about the world was in fact um, filtered through, through our culture. And for me, growing up in a primarily African-American community in Savannah, Georgia, I was clear about there are certain ways that we did things that were just different from, from other folks. And when I went to college, I was curious that I didn't feel like we were necessarily represented in the textbook. And that's why I was actually motivated to earn a PhD in clinical psychology, because I thought that I could contribute to you know, a science and just a different psychology of understanding people of African descent in particular. Thank you. And I uh, also agree, thank you uh, for this opportunity uh, to be here in uh, NAMI Houston. And, um, and I uh, also concur with a lot of what uh, Dr. Walker said. Um, you know, I, I started studying psychology because I really was fascinated by the mind and the human brain. And one of the things that, that I was taught in the textbooks and in, and in classes was that the brain is the same in all contexts. Uh, but when I was going out and doing my, my practica and working out in communities, I was realizing that that may not be completely true. Uh, and eventually I, I dove real deep into some of the work uh, regarding brain and, and culture and how these things work together. And, and something that, that resonated with me was reading how the brain develops in a cultural context. And so therefore you cannot see the brain without understanding the cultural context in which it, it develops. Uh, and, and so that, that for me completely just brought everything home. Every message that I saw out in communities working with, uh, with, with, diverse, uh, with diverse groups, with diverse patients, uh, seeing firsthand what, what that meant in, in real life. Thank you to both of you for those uh, great responses. Uh, to the streaming audience, if you have questions, please send them across to us and we will respond to them, uh, respond with them directly from, with our panelists. 
Uh, and also, if you would like to reach out uh, to gain help to, uh, for so, or someone you know is experiencing challenges in unwellness to crisis, we want you to call the NAMI Greater Houston C Center warm line 713-970-4483. That's 713-970-4483. Someone is standing by to listen to you attentively and address your issues. To Dr. Walker and Dr. Medina, in the scope of this project, one of the goals of, of the, is to broaden our discussion how the Latinx and African American communities can improve their level of access to, in the field of mental health. Uh, what is unique about these communities that contributes to the disparity and what are some solutions? And I'll have a follow-up. Have you seen, and I'll repeat it if necessary, have you seen the, the effect of what is known as a social pandemic because of COVID-19 and social unrest? What do you see as contributors? I know that's a lot, but uh, I think you guys are pretty smart, so we expect a phenomenal answer. Uh, thank you for a complex question that probably has a very complex answer. Uh, in terms of uh, some of the issues regarding disparities, you know, I, I, I see it as multiple different factors, both from us as people, us with the community that surrounds us and embraces us, as well as the context of the institutions of health and, and science. But none of that can be really talked about without discussing also just the historical perspective or the historical context. None of this happens in a vacuum. None of this is new. Uh, and so you have to think about some of the mistrust that, that comes from uh, uh, a history of, of science and medicine that, that has really helped certain groups more than others. Uh, this mistrust is then passed on from generation to generation uh, through various reasons. Uh, and so there, there's, there's so many intricacies in terms of these disparities uh, that pointing at any one particular thing would ignore a lot of other factors that, that, that come into place. Um, particularly in the Latinx community, uh, there are issues, lots of barriers regarding uh, communication, uh, and not just English versus Spanish, I mean just communication of, of doctor speak and that jargony speak that, that you keep hearing. And then a lot of us don't feel comfortable asking for, you know, follow-up questions from our doctors. And so the doctor asks, you know, did you understand what I said? And you nod and smile and you walk off and then forget everything that the doctor said on, uh, on your way out the door. And so there are a lot of communication issues. There are a lot of, you know, trust issues. And, and also just the level of that cultural competency from our providers, our, our medical institutions to work with the differences, the diversity that our, that our community brings to the table. Uh, and by basically addressing each of these factors, we hope to reduce a lot of the disparities, but, but that's a lot of work and, and, and a lot to do. Thank you. I think there was a second part of that question though that you were, you might have to come back around to, but that's okay for now. When we talk about just history, well, first we, we have to talk about history because I think unfortunately a lot of times we, we assume that, you know, people just kind of randomly are who they are or that cultural groups just kind of, oh, they just decided to be a certain way. And so this conversation about generations uh, for people of African descent in the U.S. and in other parts of, of the diaspora, culture is in part about survival. So, so just being able to live from one day to the next. And it's been, it's a challenge because everybody wants to survive. Like everybody wants to, to be able to live. But when you learn from one generation to the next how to live based on what you have access to. So as an example, if you learn that we only have access to, to certain kinds of food, and so you prepare certain kinds of foods in a way that are not at all healthy, but that's what you have, and it tastes good, but 
a few generations later contributes to, you know, chronic hypertension and all sorts of chronic health conditions, you know, part of that is, well, this is how you learned to survive. And it takes a while. It takes information, first and foremost. But I do also believe that it takes a lot of um, time and understanding and kind of undoing a lot of what was, what was learned. But yes, I agree. I mean, the issues are really very, very complex. Uh, the idea of mistrust, you know, it didn't come from nowhere. So it's not just random. And it's important for us, you know, for us to be aware that, yeah, well, well we know. I mean, we, we know that the mistrust exists. It's incumbent on the providers to be able to communicate effectively and also to be reliable and be trustworthy and to do the extra work that a lot of providers just aren't doing in order to overcome the, the trust that exists in the communities. And um, it's unfortunate. If you wanted to ask the second part of the question again, so that maybe I could pretend to take a, yeah. Thank you, doctor. <laughs> How have you seen the effect of what is known as a social pandemic because of COVID-19 and social unrest? What do you think are the contributors? And you wove some of that in your, in your response as well, but you can certainly highlight that oh. and enlighten us. Okay, well, I'm glad you, you liked what I said before. Um, She's my friend. <laughs> <laughs> On some level, I, I go back to the mistrust. I mean, even when I have conversations with people that I, that I know well and that I think are on, you know, some of the same conversations, there's this idea that as an example, well, you know, you can't trust what they're saying out there and you can't trust what's in the media. And I'm thinking, well, is it worth it to take a chance? Uh, and so I just do what makes sense for me, but recognizing that for a lot of people, you know, everybody's doing what makes sense for them. And a lot of people are still trying to, to survive. You know, there's unfortunately a lot of, of joblessness. You know, people are, are struggling even now, just trying still to survive, pay rent, pay mortgages. And what, is that, what does that look like? And still try to have some semblance or some ability to be able to not just take care of ourselves, but sometimes children, parents and grandparents and extended families. So it's, it's just, it's a lot, it's a lot. And I recognize that people are really struggling and I hope that folks will take advantage of the number that you mentioned as an access point to get some, to get some help. Yeah, and I think to piggyback on that response to, you know, it took a long time to get to where we are, and it's going to take a long time for us to kind of progress out of it. And so the, you know, this, this historical perspective, these generations, and so forth, these racialized institutions that have created barriers, put uh, access out of the hands of some some folks uh, and so to be able to open those doors remove those barriers increase access is kind of uh, and I don't want to use this term of, of, of an uphill climb but it is undoing a long standing system that wasn't meant for us great we have a question uh, from the audience and the question is my adult son deals with things as they are now in spite of a brain that lives in another storyline, but I still deal with pain of, of his illness. Is there a pathway for parents to work through problems when they have already lost their adult children to a disease like these? Thank you for that question. Yeah, I, I certainly appreciate the question. And my, I appreciate that the person was here and had the wherewithal to say, let me find out what some of these folks are talking about. And I think one of the biggest challenges for us as, as humans is the desire for, for control and to be able to control things that we don't necessarily have control over. And so I would advise parents, you know, whether they have an adult child or not adult child, you still have, you're still responsible for the person, you know, to be, to be present and to be as present as possible and recognizing that, yes, he has some limitations, but presumably he's content with what he has access to. And so accepting that you know, maybe I can just do what I can for my adult son, you know, and, and maybe manage my own stress because what happens oftentimes is that the stress that parents feel, they pass on to their children, whether they're young children or older children. 
And so I, I certainly applaud the parent for, for being here for the conversation tonight. Thank you. Can you describe prof uh, the professional and clinical terms such as cognitive behavioral, ther behavioral therapy and other methodologies common to therapeutic practice? Also dialectic behavioral therapy, DBT, better known in the field. Uh, great question, and, uh, and I will definitely have Dr. Walker chime in. Uh, these terms are all essentially just models of therapy or approaches to therapy uh, that are structured. They, they follow a, a particular um, history, a particular theory, and have been shown systematically in research to work in certain ways, on certain folks, for certain conditions. Uh, one of the most widely used and most widely studied is cognitive behavioral therapy. And essentially what um, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy uh, relies on is this idea that if I tell you that you're sad, but I want you to be happy and that all you need to do is just be happy, that's not gonna work. But what happens is that we found that people, the way they think and the way they behave can in turn change the way they feel. And so cognitive behavioral therapy focuses on the way you're thinking or your cognitions, the way you're behaving, your behaviors, so that by attacking those two areas, perhaps we can work on how you're feeling. And there are other um, different types of therapy that have taken that very general approach like dialectical behavioral therapy uh, as, as well as other types of behavioral or cognitive therapies that have been shown to work in similar ways for similar people for similar conditions and so a lot of us who are trained as clinical psychologists we learn um, multiple different types of approaches so that we have these tools in our toolbox and when someone comes in and has a particular problem perhaps one of these tools will be able to be applied in a way that's effective and has been shown by the science and the, and the research to actually help be, uh, help folks. Yeah, I'll give it actually an illustration that we use with our clinicians in training and that they oftentimes use with patients and clients. And that is, imagine you're walking down the street and you see someone you know and you wave and they don't wave back. What's your first thought? It could be a number of thoughts. It could be, oh, they didn't see me. Oh, they had so much on their mind. They just, you know, were thinking about something else and, and didn't see me. Or they might say, oh, well, she ignored me. And you have two different emotional responses to, oh, she didn't see me versus she ignored me. You felt a certain kind of way when they ignore you. And so when you shift your thinking, or at least pay attention to your thinking, you can have a different kind of emotional response. And so that's something that we at least try to work with patients and clients to recognize how your thought affects your feelings. Now, we don't know whether the person saw you or not, but what matters is our investment in how we feel. And so, yes, there are a lot of different kinds of therapies, again, of which that was an illustration of CBT. Um, but I think some of the differences also to recognize is that because we, we hear in our clinic where people will say, you know, well, I went to therapy, but it wasn't very helpful. Like the CBT and the DBT that Dr. Medina was describing, like they're more goal oriented, like you're trying to get to a place where other kinds of therapies, uh, and again, they vary, but the therapies that have less structure the person may be getting support. And it is nice sometimes just to have someone listen. But if a person has a more severe or serious kinds of problems with depression and anxiety, which are the most common kinds of emotional health challenges, it really does help to have some structure to the therapy where you're getting homework to do and you're you know, tackling some of the thoughts that affect your mood uh, and also your behavior. And to me, it's similar to like medicine, right? You have, uh, you might have high blood pressure and we have multiple different medications that we've shown over and over again in the research help with blood pressure, but not everyone 
reacts the same way to this to that one medication with their blood pressure and so occasionally it's trying to find the right medication or the right combination of medications to help with that the same goes with with therapies thank you dr walker you recently published your book on the unapologetic guide to black mental illness and as a result you've been in quite demand Congratulations. Can you tell us a little bit and the summary of the intent of the book and the reception that it has received nationally? Well, thank you. The reception has been, it's been good. And I appreciate that because my goal was to write something that would be helpful for everyday people. So going back for a second, I've been studying and trying to understand mental health crisis for some years now and trying to understand the balance between, you know, someone who, you, you may have two different people who go through the exact same uh, stressful event, but one person is okay and the other person just isn't. And so I'm trying to, you know, been trying to understand what are the factors that contribute to that. That's one part of the story. More recently, in the last few years, I've observed more mental health crisis, particularly in children. And at that point, I thought, you know what, and especially, I'm sorry, in African-American children. And so I was motivated to write the book because my thinking was that, well, while the children need help, the adults are in charge. And I wondered that because there's so much untreated depression, again, and anxiety among adults, that if we could manage that better, then we, could, we would see a bit of a trickle down, so to speak, for our children's health and well-being. So yeah, so I wrote the book in order to unpack this mental health thing, because a lot of people hear mental health and they think crazy. And no, that's not what the book is about. The book is about how we are able to basically be our best selves so that we can take care of our children, take care of our own health, maybe even begin to do the things that we were put on earth to do, while also managing the threats to all of those things. So I spend a couple chapters actually talking about the impact of, of racism, because despite the current reckoning that's going on in our society, I don't see it going anywhere. Nevertheless, it impacts us psychologically. And so I spend a couple of chapters really just trying to help folks understand what the impact of racism is and how it can um, impact anxiety. And more importantly, including some tools. So the first half of the book is about unpacking some things. And the second half of the book is, okay, what can we do? Like, what, what are some strategies? Because I don't see things turning around in our society as quickly as they might need to be. But um, I think there are certainly some things that we can do to, to protect ourselves better and also to protect our children. Thank you, doctor. Um, and I love the examples that you give in the book that are explicit and practical, whereby one can take uh, that information and put it into practice uh, relatively quickly. And I think that's important for a behavioral and cognitive change that you both mentioned in your um, analysis, your response. Do you, second question from the general audience, do you think it is necessary to change the DM, DSM-5 due to a cultural, due to cultural differences? I'm sure this is a big topic at your conferences all over the country, and uh, you probably have been debating this for a number of years, maybe not DM-5, but maybe for Uh, that is a great question, uh, and, I, and I'm laughing because I remember sitting in a classroom uh, uh, in, uh, with a bunch of medical students, and, and the instructor was a psychiatrist who uh, had been trained with Freudian psychoanalysis, and he picks up the DSM in front of the whole class, and he says, you know, I feel the need to tell you that one of the biggest <laughs> issues with this book is that it was written by all white people. <laughs> and it started this wonderful discourse about uh, how, how we label mental illness or mental health issues or even just symptoms has a lot to do with the perspective of the people who are viewing, assessing, evaluating, diagnosing each of those things. The DSM is not the end all. 
Uh, there are actually multiple different diagnostic manuals. And for those of you who don't know, the Diagnostic uh, Statistical Manual, or DSM, now in its fifth iteration, uh, is a, a manual used by psychiatrists and psychologists to help diagnose everything from depression and anxiety to obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia, and so forth. Uh, and it's... it's uh, used a lot, but it's it's definitely not the only thing out there to use. And, uh, and multiple diagnostic manuals have actually been created throughout the world and are used by different cultural groups. And so I think instead of trying to, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, and the DSM over the last couple of iterations has tried to do this, but actually just creating cultural awareness and cultural competency and developing that so that you can actually try to see what is real, for instance, depression or, or, or what we should be perceiving as depression versus somebody who is having a tough time adjusting to stressors or, or uh, uh, an environment that makes it very difficult to, to survive, as Dr. Walker said earlier. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Medina, what has been your experience in working with organizations such as NAMI and their approach to peer ad advocacy? I think uh, organizations that uh, rely on peer, things like peer advocacy, but primarily just community-based solutions tend to be much more culturally tailored, community responsive, and much more effective than a lot of the top-down uh, sort of systematic or institutional uh, ordinances and programming that, that's out there. Uh, the fact is that, that we're more likely to listen and respond to people that we know, people that are in our own backyard, people that, are, that we grew up with, than we are to some talking head on television or at, a, at an institution uh, like ours. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience. In this scenario of multiple stressors, COVID, police brutality, loss of jobs, domestic stress with family at home all the time, are there resources to assess one's stress? Also, any guide on how to manage personal stress? Different strategies work for different people, but is there a guide to navigate distressing techniques. Thank you for that uh, illustrious question. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't say that there are a number of techniques that I, I do describe in the book because a lot of the, the burden and the weight that people are feeling with all of what was listed in that, in that question, it can accumulate. And so if we can manage each stressor, maybe one at a time, then you know, we won't have this sort of compounded effect of COVID and job loss. And I saw that, you know, the family at home all the time. Uh, you know, every time I come in the house, you're in the house. And so one of the things that I do, because again, I recognize that when we hear the word mental health, a lot of us just run in an opposite direction. Like mental means crazy, and we don't want to be associated with this idea of mental health. And so one of the things that I do in the book is to talk about this idea of psychological fortitude. So kind of shifting the narrative to recognize that, you know, we all have our strengths. Sometimes we don't recognize them, but we all have our strengths and we have the ability to deal with the stuff. So one thing that helps is to have a zero to 10 rating. It's, it's really easy. So on this zero to 10 rating, in the book I talk about psychological fortitude as a rating of your ability to be able to go to work or not go to work, but just do your work because you're already work at the house. You all know what I'm trying to say. So do the work, take care of the children, cook, remember to take medication, um, maybe, maybe get some rest. And again, navigating race-related police violence as an example and seeing all of what we've seen on the television. Breonna Taylor's family still can't get justice. It's a lot. And so the first thing that we want to do is say, okay, on a zero to 10 rating, how am I doing in my ability to just be able to function? And if we're at a seven, eight, nine, you know, if folks are at a 10, I'd, I'd love to meet you. But if folks are higher, then, you know, you're probably doing okay. But I'm guessing that the person who asked the question probably falls, you know, six or lower. 
And some things that you can do, really easy things, is when you're taking a shower, just be in the shower. Because especially if there's a lot of folks at home, there's almost no quiet or private time, except maybe when you're in the shower. And so rather than going into the shower and just thinking about all the things that aren't going wrong, that are going wrong, just be in the shower. That's one thing. Um, another thing that, you know, because we've talked a lot about thoughts and Reverend Allen asked a question about cognitive behavioral therapy, writing down the thoughts, because a lot of us are like, you know, our minds are like hamsters on a hamster wheel. It just keeps going and going and going and going. And that adds to the stress, especially if some of those thoughts are, if these children don't sit down somewhere and be quiet, um, or if they don't stop yelling at each other, because the kids are stressed out also. So they're trying to manage their lives without being in a summer camp or spending time with their friends. But again, just taking time to just think about, okay, what, what all am I thinking right now? Putting them on paper and just doing your best to walk away. Because sometimes I think that we, we believe that if we overthink our thoughts then that'll help us to feel better, but it really doesn't work that way. It's better to put them down and walk away. Um, a couple other things, just taking a time out. I have actually gone and sat in my car in the garage and listen to my favorite songs just for a few minutes. And again, just to kind of reset a little bit because we're, we're in this for a little while and it's important to recognize, okay, what are some little things that I can do right now? You don't have to do a big thing, just do a small thing. Steal that time in the shower, write down your thoughts, listen to your favorite playlist. Even the time that it takes to create the playlist allows you to decompress even if only for a few minutes. And in terms of, uh, you know, part of that question was also just how to navigate some of the techniques that are out there. Uh, and I, I, I love those, those examples because they're all so simple. They're, they're not expensive and you can do them pretty much at any time. And there are definitely a lot of techniques that are being offered online. There are apps that tell you, hey, subscribe for this monthly fee and we'll provide you with a lot of relaxation, meditations and so forth. And you don't need to go that far. But I do think it's important, one, to identify when you are stressed and you don't have to go out and buy any fancy wearable device that's going to tell you your heart rate variability or your whatever. Uh, sometimes it's as simple uh, as I haven't had a good night's sleep in about a week or even just even a couple of days. Or, hey, my, I, I, I am feeling... Uh, lightheaded, dizzy, my blood pressure is rising, or I, my hands are swollen, and so, and so forth. A lot of these different types of sensations can be, not always, but they can be stress-related. So being able to identify when you particularly are stressed, so and in, in learning what are the things that trigger that, get you to that point so that you can start attacking the problem before it gets too bad. We're all annoyed right now with the, the, the staying at home and the limited socializing and, and not being able to do everything we want to do. Um, but being able to identify when we need to take those, those me breaks, uh, as selfish as it sounds, but uh, I always tell my patients, if you're not around to take care of those you love, then who will be? And so we, we really need to do this, not just for the sake of ourselves, but the sake of our loved ones. Thank you. Just before we get to another question uh, from the audience, I have a commercial uh, that I want to give again. If you have like to reach out to someone who, um, if someone or you or someone you know is experiencing some challenges and unwellness to crisis, please call the NAMI Greater Houston C Center warm line at 713-970-4483. 713-970-4483. Also, we will have the resource guide populated toward the end of this session in about 15 to 20 minutes. We'll take our next question now. Thank you, doctors. You are just, uh, you, we're doing very well in, from my perspective. How, how would you tailor psychotherapy therapy for uh, therapies for culturally and in linguistically diverse populations, noting that most randomized controlled trials for CBT, DBT, etc. are predominantly white participants. 
That sounds like a clinician's question, doesn't it? I think that question came from a clinician. I don't know if you, uh, you, you know it did. <laughs> you know it did. Thank you, clinician, for that question. <laughs> that is a fantastic question, and I'm sure one that Dr. Walker, I know I have, <laughs> have questioned in the past as well. Um, you know, when you, unfortunately, when you do read a lot of the research, and not just for psychotherapies, but a lot of stuff in general. Um, you know, in my field, I, I study Alzheimer's disease, and some of the most widely cited literature is maybe over 90% white samples. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I personally, I question many times um, the, the applicability of, of different treatments, different therapies, and so forth. Uh, in terms of clinical trials, um, uh, Hispanic, Latino, and Latinx individuals comprise sometimes less than one percent of the samples, and and it's, and I believe it's very similar for Black African American communities. It's just that that representation isn't there, and there and that's a whole other conversation. Um, the the thing with a lot of these therapies is that they are manualized, right? They're standardized. They they were studied in a particular way. Um, and that the effects and everything, all the results that are reported on, on the way that that was studied depends on how it was applied. But you as a clinician, um, a culturally competent clinician and a culturally responsive clinician has to be able to acknowledge with the limitations of the manual, the limitations of, of, of that therapy and never stop listening to your, to your patient or your client because ultimately that person in the room with you is the one that's bringing an expertise about their human lived experience that no manual, no textbook, no research article is going to be able to deny. Well, you wrap that up pretty quickly. Yeah, I think it goes back to, uh, again, listening, which always fascinates me how hard it is to just listen to people. But I will say oftentimes it starts with the diagnosis and whether or not we say that what someone's experiencing is problematic or not. And so with a lot of um, um, clients and patients that I, I end up supervising because I don't provide direct care, we have to pay attention not to say, oh, well, just because someone is 35 years old and living at home that that's problematic because yes in a in a eurocentric lens like oh well, why are they why are they still at home but culturally it makes sense and so we have to start there with the diagnosis and the reason that the person came in so maybe they did come in because they're having you know family stress but to automatically default and say well you're having family distress because you're 35 years old and at the house well that's that's problematic so we we have to stop there and be and check our judgments really because i think that in a lot of cases and i understand that it's because we have to we have to diagnose so we have to make some judgments but we have to be careful about the the lens that we're using to say that what someone's doing is okay or not and again yes i appreciate you know dr medina saying you have to you know, meet the person where they are. And so assuming, and I'm trying to, I wish I could come up with a pretty uh, generalized kind of um, situation whereby, well, I'll get, I know of an example as an, where a patient might say, you know, they're feeling um, overwhelmed and they're stuck at home and they're not getting out and they seem to be really depressed and not interested in life. Maybe they're sleeping poorly, eating poorly, they're just not interested in anything. And oftentimes what we might prescribe is some what we would call behavioral activation. Now the person who asked that question we know is a clinician, so you know what behavioral activation <laughs> is. Uh, everybody else, it is basically just getting up and doing something. Because the research shows that once you get going, you start to feel better. In your mind, you don't want to do anything. But if you just start doing, you'll feel better. Well, what if that person lives in an environment where they don't feel safe going out like you have to be able to ask the questions to make sure that there's no limitations to the patient being able to do what they're being advised to do but again that's related to listening 
and being willing to ask the questions to make sure that there are no barriers. And the reality is that I would expect for folks to do that regardless of the patient's cultural or ethnic background. So if you're just doing your job or if you're just doing what it is that you're trained to do, then I imagine that you will meet each patient where they are regardless of their racial or cultural background. But we do have to be willing to ask some of the questions, you know, how important is your culture to you? What does it mean? What does your culture mean to you, you know, with regard to your family, with regard to how you make decisions? And then go from there and tailor the treatment from there. Thank you. Next question, are psychologists, clinicians contributing information on PTSD from slavery being passed along gen gen genetically to reparations conversations? How do we, how do we have, uh, how do we address, have to address a mental health issue and, and issue recovery in a crazy world with specific ongoing implicit biases, African-American women intersectionality, the very real wealth gap and wage disparities. For example, when you are ambitious, accomplished, educated in America and constantly placed in boxes, stereotypes, lack of opportunity, and you don't want to be a victim. You don't want to aim lower professionally uh, and become uh, and to avoid the imposter syndrome, depression, anxiety, and other mental health issues cause constant conflict. Okay, I got to stop there. I, I we can't we that's a very very lengthy question. It may be several questions involved. Obviously, let's see what we can digest for there, <laughs> Dr. Medina. And then y'all 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 in the classroom today. We in the classroom indeed. <laughs> that person needs to be on the panel. Yeah, and uh, and and I don't know if I'm reading too much into this, but my very first just gut impression is that the person who shared those questions is going through a very tough time. Uh, and, and so to you, um, you know, we don't want to make light of the situation and, yes. and we hear you, we feel you. Uh, and these are really important questions, really important topics. The fact is that, um, you know, one of my favorite scholars one, uh, in, in her book, one of the first things she says is I was, raised in one culture and educated in another. And that is a position that I choose to privilege. And to me, that's extremely powerful because it, it really exemplifies this idea of straddling two worlds and, and a lot of the stressors uh, associated with that, but also being able to embody what is choice and having the wisdom to, to choose or to, to know the difference between what, what you have control over and what you don't. And also this idea of privilege and the privileges that, are, that come from many different areas like education. Uh, in the case uh, of some of the, the material that I, I gleaned from, from the questions, um, it, it, that there are uh, some factors associated with, you know, um, you being of a certain background, being in, a, in, in, in an institution that again is racialized and not, was not designed for people that look like us. Um, it ultimately, to me, and the way that I, I've learned to cope with this is acknowledging what is important to me, what is of value to me. And regardless of all the dirt and the fog and the storm and the mud, keeping in mind what is of importance to me and letting that be my guiding light. And I use the analogy a lot of the lighthouse and really using that, that imagery of the lighthouse as what is important to me, what is of value to me and letting that lighthouse help guide the boat that is my life. And that I am consistently working towards that light which is what I value and trying not to let the storm and everything else around me take me down. And, and it, it, again, that's, it, that's highly simplified and, and probably easier said than done. Um, and it's something that, that I try to practice on a daily uh, through some of the stress and coping uh, t uh, techniques that Dr. Walker uh, mentioned earlier but it ultimately comes down to what is of importance, what is of value to you. And if advancing 
you yourself as an individual, as a mother, as a student, as a clinician, as whatever that the case may be, as a sister, uh, that you keep that in mind as the driving energy that's taking you where you want to be and ultimately where I think that you, you, you could truly be. Thank you. And let me just interject right there to the questioner. I certainly was not making light of your question. It was just the, the way it's presented is fairly lengthy. And so uh, I, we understand that this is a serious matter and we certainly don't want to uh, intend to slight your question in any way. We also recommend that you seek out uh, therapeutic resources to be able to, to allow yourself uh, and others to dig deeper into some of those issues that you expressed in, in your question. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question. What are the best resources to understand Title IX and other pr uh, protections in the workplace Uh, so regarding Title IX, because that is a, a legal thing, uh, institutions, jobs, uh, businesses, et cetera, are pretty much required by law to post that, to make that information available to you. Um, if not, uh, if that's not available, um, you know, most of us carry around little computers in our pockets, uh, and a lot of that information um, is, is readily accessible. And, I, and again, I emphasize that because it is a legally binding issue, uh, it has to be made readily available. And so in terms of finding resources in, in that regard, institutions um, are expected to have offices, whether that's the ombudsperson's office or the Title IX office, or uh, one of the administrators in, in your business, uh, uh, your place of work or your institution. Uh, and so that, that information, if it's not readily available, it, it, it should still be made available. It's just sometimes having to, to uh, dig around a little for it. Um, and that, you know, a lot of institutions now do have um, mediation, do have ombudspersons, et cetera, uh, that can help with, with some of that. And it's often done in a very confidential manner. Thank you. This next question is for Dr. Walker. Uh, and Dr. Medina, you've been answering phenomenally, so I, I'm not sliding you. Uh, how can adult <laughs> serving youth identify and support Black students feeling the stress related to witnessing racial injustice, police brutality, featuring encounters with the police and dealing with mis microaggression. I truly believe more than anything that we just have to be intentionally self-aware. One for ourselves and maybe even just fears about having conversations. I think we could have more conversations if we weren't afraid of what would happen if we asked someone how they're doing. But also with youth who don't always have the language, that adults who are around can pay attention to behavior. Or at least, you know, if you don't, if you see them in person or if you see something about their disposition on the computer monitor, but these are athletes, so I'm guessing these are persons who are seen in person. I said that. <laughs> that if you notice some shift in their behavior, you know, it's, it's, it can really be as simple as that, that a person who was really outgoing and bubbly, you know, a few weeks ago now just seems like they have lost their energy. Just, you know, say, you know, hey, I noticed that there's something different about you. You know, how are you doing? What's going on? On a zero to 10, you know, how are you feeling about your ability to be able to just manage everything that's going on? Like, we don't always have to have the perfect question. And I think that's also something that can slow us down from, from checking on not just youth, but also just whoever's around us. Um, you know, so having that sense of self-awareness that we are willing and able and in a position to check in on someone else, noticing whether or not there's a shift in behavior, and then saying, on a zero to 10, what is your rating? And if the, if the rating is low, then maybe you don't have to have a, another whole conversation. You can say, hey, you know, maybe we can talk about something that has nothing to do with the, the, the challenges that were listed. 
because for young people, it's, it's hard to have the language. Uh, even for the comment that was mentioned earlier, I applaud that person for having the insight to be able to talk about you know, the tightrope because we don't always have the language. But when youth are involved, sometimes we just say, you know, hey, let's just, let's just take a time out and let's talk about, you know, I don't, uh, what's it, Fortnite. Um, you know, something they may seem to have nothing to do with what's stressing them out, but to just be present and to listen and to let the youth know that you're, they're available um, and non-judgmental because we really have to work on being non-judgmental listeners. We don't have to have advice. In fact, I recommend that people not have advice because we don't ever know what someone's going through, but to just be present and to care. And, and I do think that that carries us pretty far. Thank you so much to both of our presenters and our speakers. Uh, let me give you the NAMI website, www.namigreaterhouston, one word, dot org, www.namigreaterhouston, dot org. And there's a dot after the www because it's wild world, wide world. Let me ask you, let me, Webb, let me ask you another question. This will be, have to be our final question. Uh, thank you so much to the general audience for your participation tonight. Your questions have been quite profound. Dr. Walker, you talk about misdiagnosis. Let's unpack that. Wow, that sounds like a moderator question. <laughs> we welcome you to moderate, questioner. <laughs> Oh, okay. I was waiting for some, some more. So misdiagnosis happens. <laughs> and I honestly, I'm trying to remember, because it's, it's been a day, trying to remember, okay, when did I mention misdiagnosis? When I generally talk about it, I express it as a concern, particularly for African Americans who, as we know, the science shows us that we're oftentimes more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia which is a very serious diagnosis in which the individual has lost touch with reality, uh, than we are to be diagnosed with bipolar disorder, which is a more treatable condition. And it's unfortunate because I have heard countless stories of actually athletes, and maybe some of them have been reported uh, in the last year or so, but countless stories of persons who've been misdiagnosed and because of the misdiagnosis, they struggled for longer than they needed to struggle. And it's, it's hard enough having enough trouble or stress or, you know, disconnection or, you know, your mood being out of control and just feeling like your mind has taken over in ways that you don't intend. That's hard enough by itself. But when there are people around you who may be prescribing medication, and I will say that when medication works, it absolutely works. No one asked that question, but it's, some, it's one that's come up for me a lot when people say, well, you know, my doctor tried to prescribe me medication. You know, do you think that's a good idea? And I ask more questions like, well, how long have you been struggling and what kinds of things have happened or what kinds of interventions have they tried that haven't worked? And they say, you know, I've been struggling for years. Well, you might benefit from medication but you also have to have the right medication. Kind of like Dr. Medina was talking about, you know, if you have high blood pressure for some people, different medications work, but they're definitely not likely to work if you have the wrong diagnosis. So that's one of the reasons I, I mention it and I, I talk about it often because it, it troubles me that people who are struggling are often, are sometimes struggling unnecessarily because they have been diagnosed with the wrong um, psychological disorder. And I think to piggyback on that, it comes from uh, clinical decision making and clinical decision making can be affected by a lot of different things, including implicit biases, like our, one of the earlier questions. You know, when, when a, 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 a patient comes in and is describing pain, for instance, doctors may view that pain differently depending on your race and what you look like or how you speak. And so uh, it's important to, to note that that clinical decision making is, sometimes is being done very quickly and with limited information. And so it's so important, so key to ask questions from your provider and to provide as much information as necessary to avoid misdiagnosis and mistreatment. Mm -hmm. So if you aren't telling your, your provider like, hey, I'm also taking these over-the-counter supplements or these other medications, that medication that they're prescribing you may not have the effect that they're looking for, may have a bad reaction to it, or 
just may be the wrong medication for you. And so being able to provide your, with your provider with the information necessary to improve clinical decision making will reduce misdiagnosis. Question to our producer, how much time do we actually have left? Uh, let me just go uh, to, to this point and uh, thank the presenters. Thank Dr. Walker and Dr. Medina. Thank you so much for coming to us and taking time out of, out of your schedule. Um, we also want to thank the St. John's family, Pastor Rudy Rasmus and Juanita Rasmus for allowing us to come into their house tonight and to be able to shoot this uh, event live. Thank you to the staff, uh, Brother Jermaine, Brother De Derek, also to Pastor Tiffany. We could not do this without you. Also to Jessica, McDaniel, and Vincent. We are so thankful. We also have uh, the C Center uh, that we want to bring up on the screen for you, the resource guide uh, relating to emerging unwellness, unwell, there are three conditions, and in, in crisis. Um, we are going to run the commercial momentarily. Thank you again for joining us. We look forward to you seeing, seeing you next week for our Facebook Live and Zoom event on next Thursday, 6.30 to 7.30, where we will be doing all of the event via Zoom streaming. Thank you again for attending Dialogue 2, the Diaspora Dialogues. God bless. NAMI Greater Houston offers a warm line where operators are ready to receive questions or provide emotional support for you or a loved one dealing with stress related to COVID-19, community trauma, or any other trigger leading to mental or emotional health concerns. The warm line is open Mondays through Fridays, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Calls are confidential and we provide sincere, uncritical, non-judgmental support and we can connect you to community resources. Call us at 713-970-4483.